The title of this podcast is A Sudden Punch to Shatter Glacial Rigmarole. Pretty great title, uh, but I can't take credit for it. That title is a, a an amalgam of two phrases from Winston Churchill's uh, World Crisis, from volume four of his five volume series, The World Crisis, which is a history of the First World War and of the immediate post-war years. And I've been reading this series now for probably about a month and a half, worked my way through the first three volumes. I Honestly, I can't say that I liked the first three volumes that much. There were some parts that were not bad, but on the whole, I was a little bit disappointed with the overall tone and composition of the book. It was, it, it read a lot more like an official papers version of the war rather than a racy, anecdotal, descriptive, and uh, a rhetorically compelling type of account that I would have expected from the prime minister, knowing, as I do, that he is a master of English prose. But then again, it makes sense. I mean, this, this, this book series was written in the 1920s, and at that time, he still had ambitions of getting back into power. So Mr. Churchill did not really want to alienate anyone or really air too much dirty laundry. But it still is worth reading. It still is very, very much worth reading. And I'm still going to recommend reading the series if you have the time, if you have the inclination. Uh, I bought the series from Amazon. It's a reprint. It was like $100 for all, all five volumes. And I think it was worth it. Very much worth it. I, I enjoy it. Uh, just to hear a historical narrative by someone who was in a position of authority at that time, who was there to witness the events, to see things, that really is worth something. That really is worth something. It really is worth something. The immediacy of the chronicle, the compelling nature of the narrative is what makes it worth reading. But I wanted to do this podcast because I'm getting to the, the part of the immediate post-war years. And the prime minister talks about how there were three problems. One of the, there were three issues that he used as a way of shattering what he called, or just breaking through. A, he talks about a sudden punch, a sudden punch being necessary to break through glacial rigmarole. And what he meant by that was sometimes you have to shock the system. If you if you, if things are, are at an impasse, if things are at an impasse, if they are in a gridlock, if things are not moving, if there is just paralysis in the system, sometimes you have to take action. Not sometimes, all the time you have to take action to try to shatter that gridlock and get things going again, break the log jam, get the ice cutter, blasting through the ice sheets and carve a way through to get yourself out of that mess that you're in, that you've dug yourself into. Because if you ever are dug into a hole, which we are now, we are in a, we have dug ourselves into a hole right now. And if you ever find yourself in a hole that you've dug for yourself, you've got to take action, firm, decisive, compelling action to get yourself out of that hole. Nothing else is going to do it. Nothing else is going to answer the mail. Nothing else is going to matter. So you've got to do it and you've got to do it now. So that's the message. That's the message. And Mr. Churchill uses three specific examples from 1919 to illustrate that point. And you know, I was joking earlier on Twitter that one of the distracting things about reading this account is that it's very difficult to speed read Churchill's prose because I keep hearing the prime minister's voice in the back of my mind, in the recesses of, recesses of my mind. I don't know why, but just maybe he's just such a compelling orator and I've heard his voice so many times that, um, you know, you, you, you just hear it. For example, let's, let's take this sentence here. I'm just, I'm just opening the book here. The last incident that I shall record came under my personal notice. Well, when you read that, what you often, <laughs> what you often read is, you know, the last incident that I shall record came under my personal notice. Something along those lines. You hear the gravelly cadence of Mr. Churchill's voice and maybe that does add something to the experience, but it still slows you down a little bit, but that's okay. There are three incidents, three incidents that he talks about. The first one was an incident of rioting in London. There were some soldiers who were 
on their way to the uh, the war zone in Europe. And sometimes these things happen in in military environments. There was some frustrations that had been that had built up, and there was there was some incidents of uh, insubordination and rioting. And I will read this uh, section here from the book to let you know what this was all about. All right, uh, Mr. Churchill says, The last incident that I shall record came under my personal notice. At half past eight on the morning of February 8th, I was summoned urgently to the war office. As I drove thither, I observed a battalion of guards drawn up along the mall. I passed through the Admiralty Arch and reached my office without remarking anything else unusual. Arrived there, I received a disagreeable report. About 3,000 soldiers of many units and all arms of the service had gathered at Victoria Station to catch the early train for those returning from leave. The director of movements had failed to make adequate arrangements for the transport, feeding and housing of leave men coming in this case principally from the north. The poor soldiers, many of whom had waited all night on the platform, none of whom could obtain food or tea, felt it was very hard to be going back to France now that the fighting was over and the war was won, while so many of their comrades were, as they had been told, snapping up the best billets in England. They had suddenly, upon some instigation, resorted to a body, resort, uh, res resorted in a body to Whitehall, and were now filling the horse guards parade armed and in a state of complete disorder. Their leader, I was informed, was at that very moment prescribing conditions to the staff of the London Command in the Horse Guards building. Okay, so what you had here is basically an incident of insubordination slash rioting. All right, so what did, uh, what did Mr. Churchill do? He says this, I asked whether the battalion would obey orders and was answered the officers believed so. On this, I requested the generals to surround and make prisoners of the disorderly mass. They departed immediately on this duty. And that's what he did. He gave the orders basically to surround the rioters, to disarm them, to capture them, and to take into custody their leaders. And this is what happened. The grenadiers with fixed bayonets had closed in upon the armed crowd. The household cavalry had executed an enveloping movement on the other flank, and the whole 3,000 men had been shepherded and escorted under arrest to Wellington Barracks, where they were all going to have breakfast before resuming their journey to France. No one was hurt, very few were called to account, and only one or two were punished, and that not seriously. A large portion of the blame lay upon the administration which had no change, which had made no change in its routine at the railway stations since the fighting had stopped. So, the point there is, Mr. Churchill took decisive and prompt action to shatter that gridlock and to resolve the incident of disorder and rioting. But there are some even better examples. There are some even better examples here. The second one, the second example I'm going to talk about was a example of how the prime minister, well, he was not the prime minister then, obviously, but how Mr. Churchill uh, arranged for the distribution of food to Germany, which in the immediate post-war months was on the verge of starvation. Things were very, very dire in Germany in 1918, 1919, 1919, 1918, 1919 period. Things were very rough because there had been a blockade upon Germany for the duration of the war. And by that time, things were very, very grim. Things were very grim. You know, I've seen photos published in books where people were stripping horses in the streets, stripping the meat off them. I remember even reading uh, somewhere that uh, the philosopher Oswald Spengler himself was uh, reduced to to uh, uh, really having to ration his food. He, he, he barely had enough to eat. So things were pretty grim. And we have to remember that in 1918, 1919, in the immediate post-war months, there were the feeling, the hatreds of war still ran high. There was a lot of resentment. There was a lot of hatred. There was a lot of anger among the belligerents towards each other. And there were many in France and England who basically said, we don't care. We really don't care that much. And they can all go to hell as far as we're concerned. And similar types of, um, you know, regrettable 
uh, sentiments, but understandable under the circumstances. One one could understand this is this is how you know you have millions of people dead, a war that had gone on for years. So you can understand. Uh, obviously, you don't condone it, but you can understand the origins of it. Now, the the um, I will I'll read the relevant sections here in the world crisis where you can see what uh, what happened. But a hard story has here to be told. The armistice conditions had prescribed that the blockade of Germany was to continue. At the request of the Germans, a clause had been added that the Allies in the United States contemplate the provisioning of Germany to such an extent as shall be found necessary. Nothing was done in pursuance of this until the second renewal of the armistice on January 16, 1919. In fact, the blockade of Germany was extended to the Baltic ports and was thus made more severe than before. The food situation in Germany had become grave, and painful stories circulated of the hardship of mothers and children. During these months, very few people in Germany, except profiteers and farmers, had enough to eat. Even as late as May, members of the German delegation at Versailles were suffering from the after-effects of want of proper food. There was in France, and to some extent in England, a deliberate refusal to face these facts. In January 1919 began a prolonged series of negotiations upon the conditions under which food might be imported into Germany. Public opinion in the Allied countries was callous. Their leaders were overwhelmed with business. A possible charge of pro-Germanism intimidated politicians. The officials into whose hands the arrangements fell thought that they were doing their duty by haggling and stippling. Equally bad food conditions existed in other defeated states, for which partial provision was being made. There was also a general shortage of food and shipping throughout the world. But meanwhile, the Germans underwent a period of extreme stringency equal to that of a besieged town. It is remarkable that a sudden punch which destroyed this hateful deadlock originated with the British Army on the Rhine. In February, the reports of military officers which reached the War Office of the food conditions in the occupied areas became increasingly disquieting. A note of anger began to mingle in the dry official chronicles. I made deliberately a rough exposure to the House of Commons on March 3rd. We are enforcing the blockade with rigor, and Germany is very near starvation. All the evidence I have received from officers sent by the War Office all over Germany show, first, the great privations which the German people are suffering, and secondly, the danger of a collapse of the entire structure of German social and national life under the stress of hunger and malnutrition. Early in March, the food negotiations at Spa appeared about to break down in glacial rigmarole. But Lord Plummer, who commanded the British Army of Occupation in Germany, sent a, sent a telegram to the War Office forwarded to the Supreme Council, urging that food should be supplied to the suffering population in order to prevent the spread of disorder as well as on humanitarian grounds. He emphasized the bad effect produced upon the British Army by the spectacle of suffering which surrounded them. From him, and through other channels, we learned that the British soldiers would certainly share their rations with the women and children among whom they were living, and that the physical efficiency of the troops was already being affected. Armed with Lord Plummer's dispatch and with these details, Mr. Lloyd George took the Supreme Council by the throat. No one, he remarked, can say that General Plummer is pro-German. The officials were chidden, and but that's the past tense form of chide, just in case you don't know, and the negotiations resumed. The difficulties in disorganization of the world were, however, so great that it was not until May that substantial importations of food into Germany actually took place. The blockade, though according to the peace treaty in force until its ratification, disappeared altogether by the middle of July. But a great opportunity had been lost. The German people on November 11th had not only been defeated in the field, they had been vanquished by world opinion. These bitter experiences stripped their conquerors in the eyes of all credentials except those of force. Now, what do we learn from that incident? We learn that we've often heard of these types of uh, embargoes and blockades in our own time and the effect that those things have on populations and how uh, how crippling and how destructive those can be. But the point for this podcast is that 
Sometimes action has to be taken. No one wanted to take action to bring food into Germany because of the fact that no one wanted to look pro-German. No one wanted to be seen as uh, rocking the boat. Or Everyone was interested in covering their ass. Everyone was interested in covering their ass, just like so many politicians, governors, mayors now are only interested about covering their asses rather than actual solutions that are going to solve problems. But this is the time when sometimes someone has to get out there. Someone has to be the first governor, or the first mayor to take that step and to have the moral courage to stand up and to do the right thing, swim against the current use rationality, use the data, use realism, have the courage to do the right thing, and stop being such a gutless chicken shit. Stop being such a gutless chicken shit. That's the message. That's the message from 1919 to now, is sometimes you've got to take action to break through a hateful and a glacial rigmarole. Now let's go on to our third example. Our third example. And this is the example of the repatriation of German prisoners of war at that time. And you may not know, but after the First World War, uh, the French were holding like a quarter of a million German prisoners of war. And for some reason, they did not feel any urgency to release them. They wanted to use them for slave labor or indentured labor, rebuilding things, doing this, doing that. It was just, there was just a lot of gridlock. And uh, finally, Mr. Churchill lost his patience and did something to change that. And I will read the relevant sections of the world crisis to demonstrate that to you. He says this. A remaining task of the war office was to get rid of the 250,000 German prisoners of war in British hands. For this, we had to wait for many months. The French found it very difficult to release them. When they thought of all the slaughter represented by their capture and of the depleted manhood of France, they could not bring themselves to let these captured hundreds of thousands of unlucky men go home. It was like surrendering captured cannon. By the end of the summer, the battlefields had all been cleared. Every toil appointed to the prisoners had been performed. There was no longer excuse or reason for their retention. Yet, as Pharaoh found it of old, it was hard to let the people go. I determined to break this complex by direct action. I'll repeat that. I'll read that sentence again. I determined to break this complex by direct action. The telegrams tell the tale. And here he includes in the text two telegrams, one to Mr. Balfour and the other one to Mr. Henry Wilson. I'll read the one to um, Mr. David Balfour. From August 21st, 1919, Mr. Churchill says, After discussing the situation about German prisoners with General Asser, I am convinced that their repatriation should begin immediately. Their work is done. They are costing us more than 30,000 pounds a day. A fine opportunity of repatriating them is afforded by using the return trains which are bringing back the British divisions from the Rhine to French ports. In addition, they can proceed by march. I have therefore given directions to prepare plans for both these methods. The operation will begin at the earliest possible moment and at latest by September 1st. May I urgently appeal to you to set the machinery in motion at your end, which will ensure the reception of these prisoners in Germany. 80% of them belong to unoccupied Germany or our own area, and less than 20% to territories under Allied control. I propose to begin with the German repatriation. Every day counts, as every day trains are arriving with Rhine soldiers and going back empty. And then there's the second telegram, Mr. Churchill, to, to Sir Henry Wilson. And he says, Please see my telegram about the German prisoners and do your utmost to facilitate immediate action. The whole economy of this army depends upon it. We should not hesitate to act independently of the French. Will you communicate direct with Asser, advising him when he may begin? He could fill every train returning to the Rhine from tomorrow onwards. 10,000 at Aldrich, for example, could start at once. I am counting upon sanction being given within the next two or three days. All went well. The French delayed no longer, and the process of repatriating the immense numbers of German soldiers who were eating their hearts out in captivity, once begun, continued without ceasing, until one more miserable relic of the war had passed out of daily life. I like that last clause, until one more miserable relic of the war had passed out of daily life. 
And, you know, I look forward to relics of the current miserable situation from passing out of daily life as well. But the point here is, the point here is that Mr. Churchill, like any good leader, like any decisive leader who cares and is trying to solve problems and has guts, any leader will actually move and will decisively intervene and sometimes take out the hammer, take out the sledgehammer and smash and shatter that gridlock. Have the moral courage to do something. Don't just, don't just be a chicken shit and go with the flow and wait to see what everybody else does or is doing, which is what all these governors are doing now in the United States. Everyone's watching. Everyone's waiting. Uh, I know you can say that, oh, they're, you know, testing. No, no, no. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. These excessive lockdowns were, were excessive. They were broad and overreaching. And they, history, will, history will tell what results they had. History will tell. But it's very clear that the continuance of the vast majority of them is resulting and will result in more economic damage than it will result in positive gains in the field of health. And these are the hard decisions that leaders have to make. These are the hard decisions that leaders have to make. You can't just go with the flow. If you're in charge, you're not there just to be a, a, a chicken shit, uh, uh, ass-covering flunky who's just going to lick his finger and raise it to the wind and see which direction the winds are blowing and go with the flow. You've got to do, so, you've got to do something. Do your job. Do your job. And the point of this podcast was to show three examples of how Winston Churchill in the immediate post-war months took action to break through gridlocks. And, you know, any historical figure, if you read the life of any historical figure or any historical account in general, you can find a million examples similar to what I just, what I just discussed. You can find millions of examples. They're all out there. They're, they're out there. I just happened to be taking these examples because this is the book I'm reading right now and I'm sharing that with you. So that's how that goes. So anyway, you've got the point. Hope you've internalized it. So get in there, go out and get them. <laughs>